next slide. Gotcha, next slide after that. Mm -hmm. Next slide after that. Um, so my name is Charlie and this is Chris, and both of us do a lot of work on uh, Wolfpack, especially in um, the realm of a lot of our outreach efforts. And I think a really good way to start a presentation on our outreach efforts is to start with our mission statement. Um, our mission is what grounds our team, and everything that our team does is based around furthering our mission. So our mission is to build and expand a self-sustaining STEM ecosystem that focuses on providing robotics opportunities for everyone in our um, so over the course of the night so far, you've heard about Francis, about our origins as an FLL team, and seen some of the future of the program in the FLL team. Um, we started in that same place, except we had, you know, we didn't know what we were doing at all. It was just kind of an idea that Francis talked about, um, that was proposed by the Wilders and, and supported by Francis. And so for our first couple of years in robotics and FLL and FTC, we were building off a knowledge base, sort of, of how to do everything. For the most part, uh, this graduating team is entirely self-taught. It's a really student-driven effort for us to learn how to compete how to build robots and how to score at a high level. And so we focused a lot of, in our early years purely on sort of the aspect of being a really competitive team. Um, but as we've gotten older, we started to see the value in giving back. I think one of the really key moments for me personally was in our rookie season in FTC. Uh, FTC's team called Black Horse Robotics in Colorado spent hundreds of hours mentoring us over the course of that season and basically are such a huge part of the reason that we were one of the top rated teams that year. Um, and without that, we don't know where we would be, really. So the value of mentorship and giving back um, in that way, just talking to other teams and trying to pass on our knowledge is really important. Um, and then we started seeing value in, in, in making sure our program lasts. In the pandemic, our FOL program sort of kind of fell apart. And so we put a huge effort into trying to revive that. And that's how we got into the summer camps that Oliver was talking about. Um, and then we've also started trying to run events. Many of the parents in, this, in the crowd today have been um, working at events, and that's really important because events in first are entirely volunteer run. And so from there, we started to get into much bigger programs. And now this season, we've spent 92% uh, of all of our spending has been on outreach. As a team, we put in over 2,300 hours into it, reached over 200,000 kids, and we've also introduced, four, introduced 400 kids into first robotics teams this year that were not on it. Um, but this is a long process, so we'll try to talk about some of our first yeah, so um, this is our center goal program. Um, for us, what we think of as a program is when we um, spend a long time at a place and we continually visit somewhere and uh, continue to help mentor kids um, on basically by developing relationships with them. So four years ago, our last year in FOL, we realized, well, we, we basically realized that we have a lot of um, knowledge around FOL, and we wanted to pass it on to people. So we reached out to the Centerville Elementary School, which is just down the road from here. We reached out to Centerville Elementary School because it has the highest proportion of students on free or reduced lunch. And we really wanted to help out a group of students who, according to their principal, wouldn't really have had STEM opportunities if we hadn't come in and started the program there. Um, we worked specifically with the principal at Centerville, her name's Julie Smith to identify students who would benefit most from a program like this. And for the last four years, we've been going and running um, multi-week curriculum to teach the basics of FLL and robotics um, in a way that's approachable and fun for the kids. We really focus on making sure that the kids have a lot of hands-on experience with the robots. So we bring nine robots for 18 kids and we bring at least six people to each time so that the kids are able to really um, uh, develop relationships with us in a way that we can get to know them and help them a lot. Um, and we also did uh, 10 sessions, uh, 10, eight to 10 sessions depending on the year for the last four years. So this is a long running program that we had at Centerville and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this has had a super big impact on the kids there, but it's also had a really big impact on us as well, because we saw um, how the knowledge that was really important to us could be really important if we passed it on to other people. And um, that was really impactful for me, and I think for a lot of uh, the other people. Yeah, it was definitely impactful for me, and one of the things that Charlie was talking about in the program, uh, an F, uh, outreach program in terms of going back to the same place over and over, that really struck me was um, setting up the program where we cycle through who goes. So I got to go maybe in the first week, and then I didn't go again for five weeks. What was really impactful for me in that process was coming back again to work with the same kids, seeing them even more excited about what they were doing, and knowing so much more than they did the first time I was there, and seeing you know, just how much that helped them. 
And so over the course of the past summer, as I was kind of thinking about that and also my experience in FOL, which is that when I came to wearing, I had no interest in engineering or I was kind of like math, but I was really into STEM. Um, but Francis suggested that I join the FOL team. Um, and from there, I just fell in love with it. It's shaped my whole future and interest. I'm applying basically exclusively to engineering schools. And I don't know where I would be without it. So the value of the first opportunity um, was something I was thinking about a lot. And I realized that I uh, really wanted to create a program um, to try to provide that opportunity to more um, kids who don't have it. And so when I talked to my mom about this this summer, she suggested I reach out to Sidia, which is an international organization that, amongst other things, um, does afternoon pro uh, programming for kids in underserved communities. And through them, uh, they put us in contact with the Everett School System, and in particular, Ruby Flores, who is the STEM director of the Everett School System. Um, what we realized in Everett immediately is that it's a community that was perfect for the kind of outreach that we were trying to do. Um, Ruby herself is super energetic, incredibly intelligent, and super motivated. She's been trying for years to get an FOL program to exist, but wasn't able to get one out of coming out of the pandemic. And also, their, their student body, 85% of them are high need, and two-thirds speak in language other than English at home. So that's really important to us, because we're not trying to give FOL to kids who already have access, who can find access on their own. We're trying to bring it to a community who really wants it and doesn't have it yet. And so, as we were talking to her, she identified five schools in the Everett school system who were looking to start FLL teams. We know the cost of starting an FLL team with just the bare minimum is roughly $700, so we need to raise about 4000 to start this program. That's a very big number, but something I learned through this process is that companies and organizations are really excited to do outreach. The reason that they don't do it as much is because they don't have the time and manpower to actually be there in person. So when we go to the sponsor who we asked to sponsor this program, Paytronic, and we said, we have the curriculum, we know exactly what we're going to do, and we're going to run this program. This is the amount of money we need, and it's budgeted out. They're super willing to give it to us. So on first attempt, we got the full four thousand dollars that we needed um, to start the teams. Um, from there, um, Ruby helped identify two teachers at each school who would coach each of the five teams, and we brought as many of them down to the WIP as could come, and ran the, a mentor training session, which is where this photo's from, where we just taught them the basics of FLL and programming because the teachers didn't know anything themselves. So that was the first place that we wanted to pass on the knowledge. And so we taught them uh, like a little bit of sensor usage, how to drive robots, how to build robots, a bit about the structure of the season. Um, and another thing that I think is really impactful about this is Charlie started with our mission. That is really true to who we are, and it's important to us that we pass on that message to the teams we create. So by bringing the mentors in in person, it was easier to communicate that and make sure they bring it back to their teams. And so by teaching the mentors how to run their teams, it meant that we didn't need to be there all the time and that the teams could operate autonomously, which is the goal. With these programs, we don't want them to be a one-time thing that only works while we're students at wearing the time to go mentoring. Instead, we want them to be able to work on their own. Um, but still, because it's really important to us, and it's really fun to see the progress we're making, we managed to make six visits down to the school. There's some photos um, on the screen of us working there. And I really love this photo in the top left corner here. It's of Alma working with um, one of the students at one of the schools. And this is the moment where she was helping them write their first program that scored their first points of the season. And I remember when they played it, um, just it was the most simple mission. They just had to put something in. But all the kids started jumping up and celebrating. And the teacher got it out of the camera and they filmed it again. Um, and that was amazing. That was really important to me because that showed that the passion and what we were trying to accomplish to offer the opportunity to the students was really meaningful and impactful to them. And more so than that, they did even better than we could have imagined. Three of the teams qualified for the state championship. A peak we did not do in our first season. We're not remotely close. So um, that's amazing. We're so proud of them. And it's a program we're looking to sustain and extend in the future. Um, so another program that we started this year is our program in Rwanda. So one of our team members, Amelia, um, was moving to Rwanda for the first semester. And we realized as a team that this was a perfect opportunity to do some much needed outreach to a community that would really benefit from the STEM team. So we set a goal of starting 10 teams in Rwanda. And we um, fundraised money to get kits and registration fees and everything was ready to go. And Amelia went off to Rwanda with uh, 10 kits and a couple of contacts at a couple of schools. Um, the second she got there, she started pitching to teams, uh, mentors and school directors to try to generate excitement about STEM and about FLL, and to start passing on the knowledge that, that we had developed over so many years. Um, and on our side, we spent a lot of time developing curriculum materials for the new coaches, the new teams, and the judges, uh, so that 
they were able to run competitions and scrimmages. Um, and I personally, um, and many of the other members of our team, mentored the teams that Amelia started in Rwanda. So I mentor the Hope Bots and the Block Pythons, which are two teams from Rwanda, um, via email and uh, Google Meet. Um, but really, the kind of unique thing about this that really means so much to us is the fact that under a week after Amelia got to Rwanda, she was able to pitch to 60 schools at a STEM convention. And what this really shows is that Rwanda has so much excitement around STEM, and there's just kind of a lack of knowledge and resources. So we were able to come in with um, the resources, like we were able to come in with the kits, and we were able to come in with knowledge of how to code FLL and how to do projects and all that stuff. And we were able to pass this on. And the kids really took it and ran with it. And some of these teams came up with really incredible projects. Um, and there, one of the one of the issues was is after we got there and we talked at the STEM convention and there were there were schools reaching out to us and they really wanted to join. And we had a major problem. We had too many schools interested in starting teams. And this was this is a problem because we were like, how are we going to do this? And this is where Code Arena stepped in. So Code Arena is the operational partner for Central African FLL, which basically means they're a liaison between uh, first and the country that they're operating in. So they run all the national championships and stuff. And um, they saw what we were doing in Rwanda, and they were so excited about what we were doing that they actually donated to us the funds to be able to start 25 more teams in Rwanda, um, which was really exciting. So we have a total of 35 teams with over 350 kids um, that we started in. Excitingly, on March 4th, we hosted the inaugural FLL Rwanda National Championship in Kigali. And um, that's why Mui isn't here to be able to present, because she actually went and ran the competition, um, made sure everything ran smoothly. So um, that's why she's not here today, because she was, um, she was doing that a couple of days ago. Um, and it was a really exciting competition for us, because um, not only were the teams all super duper excited and super into it, we had over um, 500 people come and watch, and uh, there were some major um, there were some major dignitaries there, including the Minister of Information, Communication, and Technology, the Minister of Education, the Botswana Minister of Communication, Knowledge, and Technology, the Director General of Rwandan Education, and the Board of the Board. The, general, the, the head of the board of directors for UNESCO Rwanda and Dean Kamen, the founder of Coast, also was able to come into the competition for a bit. So that was really exciting for us, and um, we're working with them to expand the project for years to come. Um, and we're really excited to announce that the top two teams are actually going to be able to compete internationally, um, which is really exciting. Um, and all of this was made possible with, next slide, um, the help of our operation, our outreach partners. And what outreach partners allow us to do, as Chris was talking about the city here, um, they basically allow us to make connections and expand our range of things beyond what a group of 10 high schoolers can normally do. Um, one example of this is without the help of UNESCO Rwanda and uh, the Ministry of ICT, who invested significant manpower and time and money into the national competition that just couldn't have happened um, because of the fact that we had to pay for the transportation and all of this stuff for all of the teams. It, it was a serious um, effort from all of these organizations. But I think an even better example of how we work with outreach partners is these two organizations here, Stella and Teach Rwanda. And we're working with them to uh, they're both education uh, nonprofits that work in Rwanda. And we're working with people that work at these nonprofits, training them to be able to teach FLL to other teams. And what this allows us to do is make sure that the program is sustainable for years to come. And we really do want Rwanda to increase the number of teams over the, over the coming years. And we couldn't do that without the help of Stella and Teach Rwanda. Um, and so that begs the question. Like why outreach? Why do we do all of this? Um, roughly this season, two thirds of our time that's been spent on outreach has been sorry on FCT has been on outreach. Um, and so at our core, we really are a competitive 
FPC team, our goal is to win worlds for the season. Um, but the work we do in outreach exists entirely outside of the scope of awards. And I think really the key takeaway that we want to leave you with is that to do this kind of work, um, it's not that we have like some magic like powers or an infinite influx of money. We started all these programs with no money. We had to go find our own funding. We had to go reach out to people. We had to go do everything ourselves. But it's about taking advantage of the opportunities you have. We have a teammate, Amelia, who moved to Rwanda, and we saw that through that, we could potentially try to serve robotics teams there. We had a connection at City Year, and we knew that through them, we could reach out to cities in Boston to start robotics teams there. And so just so we're clear about like how this all works, at the start of this season, Everett had no FLL team. Rwanda as a country had no FLL team. And between those two places, there are now 40 FLL teams, and there's going to be more in the years to come. Um, and so we're really proud of what we do. We're proud to say that 92% of our spending is on outreach. We're proud to say that we're approaching 2,500 hours purely on outreach this year. Because like I was saying, as we've grown through FIRST, the focus of our team has changed. It really shifted away from just learning um, how to do robots and how to win to what our mission statement is. It's about providing access and robotics to kids in underserved communities because there's no difference between us and them in terms of the passion that they would find if they could just be offered that first opportunity. And that's important to us. And so that's really who Wolfpack is um, at our core. And that's why we do the work we do. And we want to continue to do it for you to come. Thank you.